Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart? Some people will go to any length to stay young forever. Is that someone? It's Madeline Ashton. She was a big star in the 60s. I thought she was dead. Oh, madam. You look younger every day. Thank you, Rose. But Madeline Ashton and her old friend, Ellen Sharp. I've lost men to her before. Mad Hill! Are about to go too far. A touch of magic. Drink that potion, and you'll never grow even one day older. Bottoms up. No warning. Now a warning? You pushed me down the stairs. Universal Pictures presents... Street. Bruce Willis. It's a miracle! And Goldie Hawn. Look at me. I'm soaking wet. Death becomes her. You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, the voice, Jeff Tucker. Hey, it's good to be back. It's Jeff, 91 Reasons. You know the drill. So normally you do these episodes when somebody has died. But, you know, why wait till the end when you can't talk about the person while they're still here? You know, Bruce Willis was uh, diagnosed with aphasia, which affects his cognitive abilities. It's very, it's effing tragic for a guy as vibrant and like so dynamic as Bruce Willis that I thought, let's just do some highlights of his unbelievable career and like what it meant to grow up having this guy in your life, you know? So it, 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 the first time I ever saw Bruce Willis uh, it was an episode of the new Twilight Zone. Uh, CBS reboot the new Twilight Zone in 1985. Uh, I watched every episode because uh, I was so into science fiction and writing and surprising people with your stories that the the new Twilight Zone came at the exact moment I needed something like that because it came out the same time as Amazing Stories and I watched every episode of Amazing Stories. They even brought back uh, Alfred Hitchcock Presents and I watched every episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. But I remember the Twilight Zone. uh, It might have even been the, uh, the, the premiere episode because Bruce Willis plays a guy who calls home and he answers. And so he's got like a doppelganger. And how do you deal with the fact that you've been replaced in your own life? Can't remember how it ends, what the twist was, but I remember it being really moody and not as, uh, you know, day glow as some of the other episodes of Twilight Zone. But uh, my big uh, introduction to Bruce Willis, this is this, this is so silly. Uh, he, I remember he, he was on Moonlighting, and that's where, like, all of us drama kids figured out, like, wow, this guy is, he's doing something different. Because Moonlighting was just a traditional uh, weekly mystery show, you know, two mismatched partners, uh, Maddie and David Addison, uh, solve crimes, or, you know, people hire them to to find out the truth. But Moonlighting was doing something different. They were breaking the fourth wall. They were funny. Uh, there was that will they or won't they vibe to it. And uh, we used to talk about Moonlighting uh, at high school. We would, you know, the, at lunch. Did you watch Moonlighting last night? Oh, absolutely, man. It was unbelievable. Isn't that Bruce Willis guy hysterical? Oh, my God. David Addison's the best. And he was always grooving and he was silly. And he was not, you know, he was our generation's. Columbo. I mean, that's a weird analogy, but it's close. There was an episode where they they did uh, The Taming of the Shrew. There was an episode that was black and white where they did a jazz story. And they introduced someone like me, I was 16 at the time, to new ways of thinking and new ways of storytelling. It was, it's hard to downplay Moonlighting's importance in television. Uh, I don't think people would watch it now. You'd have to really get into it. 
but it really had a, a cult following. And then, and part of that cult following was that it was always uh, on hiatus. They were always fighting behind the scenes or doing movies or they couldn't be there. And they had funny ways of telling you, the audience, that it was a repeat. The best one being, of course, Orson Welles would go, there are many things in life. And he would pontificate and pontificate and go, and of course, that tonight's moonlighting is a repeat. Uh, crazy stuff. And then finally, when, when Maddie got a boyfriend on the show, and it was played by Mark Harmon, he was an astronaut, and Bruce Willis, who loved Maddie, his character David Addison loved Maddie, he hated the new guy, so he kept calling him Luke Skywalker. And that was one of the first early ways that dialogue mentioned Star Wars. You know, we take it for granted that after the, the Tarantino movies of the early 90s, uh, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, where they referenced other movies, and Clerks, where they referenced Star Wars specifically, movies and TV shows didn't really reference each other. So him calling him Luke Skywalker was kind of a new thing. You know, the, the, the stars from Star Wars would appear on shows like uh, Donnie and Marie and, and, and variety shows like that. But just making it an organic part of the plot by having the characters mention movies that they saw and such. that They just didn't do that. So that was, a, to me, a big deal. Like, he's calling him Luke Skywalker. That thing I like, he likes too. We like the same thing. But this, the funniest way I learned about Bruce Willis as a movie star was the film Blind Date, 1987's Blind Date, him and Kim Basinger. Uh, Bruce Willis, it's, one of the, it's a comedy of errors. He plays a guy who one terrible thing after another happens to this poor guy just over and over. It's a Blake Edwards movie. Less than 12 hours ago, this man had a good job and a promising future. Last night, he went on a blind date. Today, he's paying the price. You're allowed two phone calls. It's, it's me, Walter, your brother. Walter, I'm just calling to thank you for fixing me up with Nadia last night. Hey, she's gorgeous. Oh, you were right about not letting her drink. It was really cute how a little champagne brought out those charming quirks in her personality. Walter, what? She made quite an impression on my boss, too. I'm fired. Fired? But you know what really elevated the evening out of the realm of the ordinary? Having Nadia's psychotic ex-boyfriend as a chaperone. You son of a dog! Dancing lessons we had to take in junior high, Teddy. Finally came in handy. Dennis! Moonwalk! I hate that! In fact, my evening was so entertaining, so exhilarating, so stimulating, such an utterly unforgettable experience that if I weren't already behind bars, I'd be committing a murder right now! Yours! Kim Basinger, Bruce Willis. Blind date. Anybody out there got 10 grand for bail? Like Edwards, of course, the, the guy behind, um, you know, the Pink Panther and a lot of really, 10, a lot of really funny movies. Uh, it's he, Bruce Willis takes a blind date with Kim Basinger and just one horrible thing after another happens to him. And at the end, his car is wrecked. He shredded his clothes. And it was a modest hit. But this is the height of the home video market. And uh, I've got a whole bunch of uh, home video um, promotional pieces where they tell the retailer how to order cassettes, what kind of discount you get. Because remember, these are not movies for purchase. These are movies for rental. Uh, movies purchase are called sell-through. They were normally, you know, 20 bucks. These are rental tapes that were $80. So you couldn't buy them. I mean, you could, but who's going to pay $80? Uh, my mother paid 60 for Back to the Future in 1986. That was a lot of money back then. So they would give you a price break if you bought so many copies. You know, buy in bulk, get a better, better price. And they offered helpful hints on how to sell the movie to your customers. Uh, there's a movie I have, the, uh, the paperwork for, called New York Stories, where they're like, offer a promotion where cab drivers get a free rental, or put it next to other New York-themed movies. But for Blind Date, the video store I went to, where I ended up working, 
was uh, multi-video in Bellflower. And uh, I was best friends with the guy whose dad owned the place. So this is so great. I remember going in and they had a lot of the posters for Blind Date on the wall. You know, the street date. It's coming out this day. And the contest was put your name here and you could win a blind date with the owner's son. And I remember going to him, we'll call him Jimmy. Uh, I remember going to Jimmy and saying, what's with the contest, man? You're, you're, you're pimping yourself out for a free, for like a date. And he goes, yeah, my dad's going to pay for like dinner and a movie. And I was like, oh, but like, what if you pull a name and it's someone you don't want to go out with? And he goes, oh no, we're going to figure out who the winner is by, you know, we're going to vet the, uh, the contestants. So he was just using it, you know, to get girls, which, hey, that's a brilliant idea. And I don't remember how the date went. I think it was a disaster. Like, I think it was not obviously as bad as the one portrayed in the movie, but I don't think it was, you know, a love connection. You know, I don't think they had a second date. But that was, you know, how I saw uh, Blind Date in the uh, video store. And then, you know, I watched it. And it's, it's moderately funny, you know. Bruce Willis is uh, very charismatic. He's a good actor. We loved him on Moonlighting. It was no doubt that he was going to jump to the big screen. My friend Toby uh, was very into Bruce Willis's album from 1997, The Return of Bruno, where Willis played a guy named Bruno who was putting the band back together. Now, in all fairness, I have to admit, I have this album on CD, and I listened to it more than is healthy. I listen to this album a lot. It's covers, it's Under the Boardwalk, Respect Yourself, a bunch of cover songs done with a harmonica and blues. And you know what? For something I dismissed in the 80s as, oh, that's just celebrity cheese. There's nothing exciting about that. Uh, I, it's, it's an album I actually enjoy quite a bit. I think it's uh, it's got the right amount of self-awareness. Uh, I sound like uh, Patrick Bateman in... In American Psycho, don't I? You ever listen to uh, Bruce Willis' Return of Bruno? Uh, it's a soulful R&B album where he portrays the character of Bruno. Like, that's what I sound like. Hey, me, fella. Look here. Seagulls. Body wine cooler. Seagulls. Body wine cooler. The train is dry. that album. There was a TV movie about the return of Bruno trying to sell it as a thing. But you know what? This is all a lead up to most of America, most of the world's introduction to Bruce Willis on the big screen. And that was in a tiny little movie uh, called Die Hard. <laughs> like, you, can, what do you say about Die Hard other than it is a perfect movie? Uh, it's the best action movie of the 80s. It's, it's number one. It has so many things going for it that are right. Uh, there's a little bit of cheese in it, but you can totally, um, you can totally uh, forgive that because uh, John McTiernan directed Die Hard. He's the guy who directed Predator, the one-two punch. I mean, one, two, three. He did Predator, Die Hard, and Hunt for Red October all in a row. Uh, then followed it up with uh, Medicine Man, which didn't do too well. But then returned with Die Hard with a Vengeance. It's Christmas Eve in L.A. California. Is Daddy coming home with you? Well, we'll see what Santa and Mommy can do, okay? And New York cop John McLean has come to see his wife. I missed you. Instead, he's going to have to save her. Sit down. Within this skyscraper high above the city, 12 terrorists have declared war. They're about to be to the left. Choice. 
have already killed one hostage. This channel is reserved for emergency calls only. He's inside. Who is he? Who are you then? You are most troublesome for a security guard. Sorry, wrong guess, huh? Would you like to go for double jeopardy? Do you really think you have a chance against us, sadistic cowboy? Yippee guy, mother. But you just destroyed a building. And I am in charge of this situation. Well, I got some bad news for you. Come up here, that look like you're in charge of Jack. He is alone, he is tired, and he hasn't seen deadly squat from anybody down here. Hey pal, how you feeling? The whole thing's being equal, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. I want blood and you have it. Only John can drive somebody that crazy. He's an easy guy to like. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. And a hard man to kill. Die hard. Got invited to the Christmas party by mistake. Who knew? Die Hard's a perfect movie. You know, Nakatomi Plaza, Christmas Eve, terrorist takeover, screen debut of Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber. Uh, perfect, perfect movie. You know, Die Hard is so perfect because it gets so many things right. It has a wisecracking hero, a deadly villain who shows you how, like, the, the stakes are high. The guy's wife has been kidnapped. It's a high-rise building. But it did something a lot of um, 80s action movies didn't do, and that's the hero is vulnerable. Not only is he a, one guy against an army, but he has to find a weapon. His feet get cut. Uh, the odds are against him. The outside world doesn't even believe him other than Powell, the other cop. Uh, and then the other thing that he gets right is the building, the Nakatomi building. You learn to know the ins and outs of the building so that when he makes a turn, you're like, oh, I know where he's going. You know, they do that scene where he's, he's he goes, hello, girls. And he, he sees the girls on the wall. You're like, oh, I know where we're going. So there's a lot of moments of claustrophobia, but you know where he's at in relation to the bad guys. It feels hopeless. Uh, he monkeys around in there with the elevators and playing all the games. And I remember, see, here's the thing. That stupid that stupid argument about whether Die Hard is a summer movie or a Christmas movie, for someone like me, makes no sense. Yes, it takes place at Christmas, but it was released in July, in the middle of summer. So when I went and saw Die Hard in a the theater, it was 90 degrees. So Die Hard will always be a summer movie to me, simply because I saw it in a the theater first run. You know, Die, Die Hard 2, Die Hard with a Vengeance, uh, that's a Rennie Harlan film, not McTiernan. But that one takes place at Christmas time too, in the snow and it's cold. But I remember seeing that in the heat of summer. So those are the memories I have. Gremlins was a summer movie that takes place at Christmas. Lethal Weapon was a summer movie that takes place at Christmas. Iron Man 3 is a summer movie that takes place at Christmas. So there is precedence for that. And then there is the opposite, not the opposite, but like uh, Miracle on 34th Street is considered a Christmas movie, yet that came out in the summer. So it does bounce back and forth, but I think it really depends on how old you are and when you saw it. But Bruce Willis's portrayal of John McClane created a whole new genre of action heroes, of the everyman hero. And then we ended up getting all these other Die Hard on a blank, you know. Under Siege is Die Hard on a train. Air Force One is Die Hard on Air Force One. Uh, Sudden Death is Die Hard at a hockey game. Like they did this formula over and over. They even did Die Hard in a phone booth with Colin Farrell in a phone booth for the whole movie. It's Die Hard in a phone booth. And I remember going to um, hear Randall Wallace speak. He's the guy that wrote the screenplay from the novel 56 Minutes by Roderick Thorpe. See, I'm doing all this from memory because I'm stupid. But uh, he said that uh, he was pitched Die Hard clones for years, even to the point where somebody came in and pitched, it's Die Hard in a building. And the guy said, have you seen Die Hard? And then we all argued at the end when they get into limo 
And he goes, if you guys, this is your idea of Christmas, I can't wait to see for New Year's. And he goes, oh, the weather, and the fight is right, and the car pulls off. We expected it to fly off into the sky, like Greece. Um, but Die Hard's a movie that it's so unbelievably rewatchable because Bruce Willis's performance is so good. I mean, he's just so amazing in the movie. He just nails it. And I remember the newspaper came, comes out January of all the movies that are going to come out for the rest of the year. And I think I've talked about this. It was called Sneaks. I would circle all the movies I was interested in, what I was going to see that year. And I remember seeing a picture of Bruce Willis with a machine gun. And I laughed at it. And I said, Bruce Willis? He's not an action star. He's a comedy star. What is this? This is ridiculous. But he nailed it. And it cemented him as an A-list movie star. Because after that, he could write his own ticket. Um, I'm going to go through his film, just some highlights. And his next film was called In Country. This is about a Vietnam vet who comes back home. It's with Emily Lloyd. I saw this opening day in the theater. There was a time period between probably 1987 all the way through 94 or 95 that... I pretty much saw every main movie opening day in the theater. Uh, in Country's a movie nobody even remembers. To me, it's famous because Emily Lloyd was a an actress out of Australia who was supposed to be the next big thing. And she was cast in a little movie called Mermaids where she was going to be Cher's daughter. But she dropped out because there were differences with the original director. I think it was Frank Oz. So Frank Oz was replaced by Richard Benjamin and then... Uh, Emily Lloyd was replaced by Winona Ryder. And then that becomes one of my favorite movies of all time. So everything's an accident. Uh, Look Who's Talking in 1989. Uh, this, the funny story I have about... This is a terrible movie. Uh, Bruce Willis does the voice of the baby Mikey uh, with Kirstie Alley, John Travolta. See, this movie brought John Travolta back. So as silly as it is, you can sort of forgive because it did give us back Travolta into movies. You know, because he would work steadily until Pulp Fiction, where, boom, he's A-list again. A-list. But uh, look who's talking. My friend and I went and saw this, this movie, movie in the theater at, at the Gateway Theater in La Mirada. And we paid full price because in front of it was the trailer for Back to the Future 2. So I sat there. I lost my mind seeing the trailer for Back to the Future 2. And then we got up and left. And I wouldn't see Look Who's Talking until years later on uh, VHS because it just wasn't a movie I was interested in. Uh, 1990, Summer, Die Hard 2. Uh, this is a weird movie because we were expecting the same movie again. And, you know, when you do a sequel, you can't just remake the same movie because the audience will reject that as well as a movie that's different. So you're walking a fine line. They're not all Empire Strikes Back. Some of them are Matrix Revolutions. But Die Hard 2 is not a bad movie. It's got John Amos in it. It's got um, William Sadler, who who would play Death in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, and he would be in all the Frank Darabont movies. Uh, Die Hard 2 is not a bad movie. It takes place at the uh, the airport. Holly is, uh, her plane is circling. Terrorists take over the airport. John is the only guy that can save the day. Uh, it's got a lot of great set pieces. Uh, Rennie Harlan's a different director than John McTiernan. So it is a different movie, but doesn't make it any less good. It's just not equal to the first movie, but what could be? I mean, what could be, right? Look Who's Talking 2. year later, they, of course, made a sequel because talking baby movies are cheap and they make a lot of money. Uh, after that, he is in The Bonfire of the Vanities. Uh, I saw this opening day. Nobody even remembers this movie. This is a movie with Tom Hanks and Bruce Willis and Morgan Freeman and uh, it's about a guy who uh, runs down a young man in the street and it becomes this huge, big deal. They're trying to find who, who hit this guy in the street. And Bruce Willis is a reporter who just makes it worse. And it's about, it's about the media uh, destroying lives at the cost of selling papers. And uh, yeah, it was by, based on the novel by Tom Wolf, directed by Brian De Palma, like a huge pedigree, but not a good movie at all. Uh, worth watching just as an oddity because of its infamy. After that, there's a movie called Mortal Thoughts. That's the first movie he made with his 
wife, Demi Moore at the time. He plays a, an abusive husband. Uh, not a bad little thriller. Uh, not a Bruce Willis movie, so it's okay. You know, sometimes he'd like to sit back and let the other actors do all the heavy lifting while he played a character. And you know what? There's totally nothing wrong with that. Uh, summer of 1991 brings us the massive bomb Hudson Hawk. This was Michael Lehman's follow-up to Heather's. Uh, he directed Heather's, got some injury, he's got some some credibility, and of course Joel Silver came knocking because Joel Silver loves uh, directors that he can hire and then boss around. So uh, if you've ever seen Hudson Hawk, it's a mess. It's about a cat burglar who robs buildings by singing songs because he times out the burglary through the, the timing of the song. So they sing him and Danny Aiello while they're robbing. And it's about Leonardo da Vinci's machine that can turn lead into gold. It's a complete and utter mess. But I know people, I have friends who swear that this movie's great. Um, this is a movie I, I would probably give a second chance to because it is uh, the height of Bruce Willis being charming, like just absolutely charming. After that, he was in Billy Bathgate. That's a, uh, uh, the movie's notable. It's a, it's, it's a mob movie about a mobster played by um, Dustin Hoffman. Uh, and it has uh, Moira Kelly and Nicole Kidman. And it's famous for uh, Nicole Kidman. I believe it's the first Disney full frontal nude scene in a movie released either by Hollywood Pictures or Touchstone Pictures. I'm not sure which. But uh, complete mess of a movie. I've seen it. It's three hours and it's boring. And Bruce Willis is, uh, it's like a flashback. He's hes uh, tied to a chair and they've got his feet in cement and they're going to throw him overboard. So they go through like how he got to this point. Bizarre. Last Boy Scout, another Joel Silver, big budget action movie. Uh, this is a lot of people I know their favorite movie. Uh, not a bad movie. Uh, he had a bit part in The Player. That's Robert Altman's ensemble movie about Hollywood starring Tim Robbins. Uh, it's a murder mystery. Is he going to get caught? I mean, the murder is not a mystery, but will he get caught is the mystery. Uh, I saw The Player in a theater. Uh, very, It's a great movie. Great movie. Another just forgotten gem. Uh, and then after that, he is uh, Dr. Ernest Menville in Robert Zemeckis' Death Becomes Her. This movie's insane. I was just explaining this movie to Austin the other day that it's Robert Zemeckis pushing the envelope after, I mean, talk about Roger Rabbit, Back to the Future 2, Back to the Future 3, and then he doesn't even take a breath and he's doing Death Becomes Her, which was pushing um, digital effects into the human world. We had seen the liquid metal Terminator T-1000, but this was using it to manipulate human flesh because this is a fantastic movie. Dark, dark black comedy about uh, two women who are obsessed with one-upping each other, and that includes how they look, their weight, uh, and they're fighting over Bruce Willis, who is a, uh, well, he's a mortician, who can do a great job on your face when you die. So it's great. Uh, Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn are in it. They play the warring women. And, and Meryl Streep stumbles on the, this, this rumor that Goldie Hawn's character achieved her amazing looks through trickery. So she ends up finding this group, and it's, and it's Isabella Rossellini, who offers her eternal youth by taking a potion. And at the party, you see James Dean and a bunch of other people that are, you know, they should be dead. Cause they're like, look, all you have to do is take this potion. You'll live forever. You'll look amazing. You just have to fake your death at some point and then fade into obscurity and live out your life amazingly, but private. So she takes it. She also finds out that Goldie Hawn has taken it. And how they find out is Bruce Willis has had enough of these two women and he pushes Meryl Streep down the stairs and she she's dead on the ground and he can finally be with Goldie Hawn, who he really loves. And then Meryl Streep gets up and her head's on backwards. And it's amazing. And what follows after that is like this battle where they're trying to outdo each other. Goldie Hawn gets 
shot in the in the in the stomach with a shotgun and ends up with a um a shovel through the hole like the effects for the time are amazing absolutely amazing and has a great ending where he leaves them both cuz they're crazy and they can't die and he ends up having to spray paint them to make them look even remotely normal so the last scene is them at his funeral. He's finally achieved peace and died. And they go to his funeral and they're just so gross. They're all flaky. They spray paint each other. They're all gross. And then when they're leaving, they trip and fall down the steps and break into a million pieces. But they're still alive. Oh my God. If you haven't seen Death Becomes Her, you should really seek it out. It is a crazy fun movie. Uh, movies, they don't, don't make movies like this anymore. And I know I say that a lot and it makes me sound old, but I don't care. So after that, he did Striking Distance. I saw this in the theater. It's him and Sarah Jessica Parker. Uh, it's like, they're like Coast Guard cops or something. It's so stupid. It's a simple uh, paint by number cop movie. So I think at this point, Bruce Willis sees the writing on the wall and it's he's coasted on Die Hard for a few years. So he has to reinvent himself. And he takes a smaller role in a movie, not the lead role, doesn't need 20 million to do it, works for scale, wants to show his acting chops. And he comes back as Butch Coolidge in Pulp Fiction. And I'll tell you what, we heard about Pulp Fiction for months because it played at Con and it won the big award and everybody was heralding uh, Tarantino as the next great thing. And when I finally got to see Pulp Fiction later that summer, I agreed with everybody and what they said. Pulp Fiction's a masterpiece of filmmaking, and Bruce Willis is amazing in it. And you look at him and you go, that's the guy from Die Hard, and that guy can act. And he is amazing in Pulp Fiction. Him and that uh, his, his girlfriend that he's trying to get out of town and... It all goes wrong because of the watch and the scene. You know, his memory of Christopher Walken. Pulp Fiction is a revelation. It's a revelation of a movie. Uh, it needs its own hour. It needs its own hour. But that same year, he's in some crap. He is the narrator in North and he shows up in the movie a few times. Have you ever seen or even heard of North? North is a Rob Reiner film. You know, when you do a movie like Misery, where it wins an Academy Award and everybody loves it, you get to do any movie you want. And most of the time, a director, after doing that, picks a big turkey. And Rob Reiner's big turkey is North. Uh, Roger Ebert's review of North is, I hated, hated, hated this movie. Uh, it's Elijah Wood as a kid who hates his parents, so he decides to offer himself up to anybody in the world who would be his new parents, and he goes on a whirlwind adventure, and you hate everybody in it, and you can't wait for it to end. And even Roger Ebert said, this movie should be cut up, the film, cut up into banjo picks. The same year, 1994, Bruce Willis is also in Color of Night, uh, I saw this in the theater. This is about a, a guy who experiences trauma and loses the ability to see color. And he's got a girlfriend and there's a murder scene and who's going to get killed next and what's going on. But it does feature one of the the best scenes in, a, uh, in these thrillers. And there were so many of these thrillers in the 90s, like so many of them. But it does feature um, a guy on the street being followed by a car in a parking garage, like two stories up. And all you see is the front of the car, like inching forward, following him. And you're like, well, how does he see him? He couldn't see him from where you, I mean, everybody drives a car and knows you can't see on the street from the parking garage. It's a terrible, terrible movie. So 1994 ends with Nobody's Fool. That's a very sweet little movie he did. Uh, and then he comes back in 1995 with Die Hard with a Vengeance. John McTiernan returns. They took a, a script called Simon Says and they retrofitted it to be a Die Hard movie by making the hero John McClane and the bad guy... Jeremy Irons, Hans Gruber's brother, and he's blowing up buildings in New York. It reteams Bruce Willis with uh, 
Samuel L. Jackson uh, from Pulp Fiction. And I remember going to see Dired with a Vengeance opening night. And I went back and I saw it that summer two or three times. I just thought it was fantastic. Uh, it's fun. It's like this race through New York City with the the clock ticking. And you're never quite certain, are they going to make it? Or are they not? John McClane becomes the uh, Energizer Bunny there's nothing you can do to kill him. At one point, he gets shot out of a water flume into the air and drops down. And I remember at that moment going, well, it's like a cartoon now. But I'm okay with that. It's a cartoon, but I'm okay with that. Uh, it's a great movie. Died with a Vengeance, 1995. 1995 overall was a good movie, for a uh, good summer for movies. We got to see uh, Watered World and Batman Forever and just fun, you know, popcorn movies, which I don't have a problem with. Later that year, he was in a movie called Four Rooms, which was a uh, anthology movie where Tim Roth plays a bellhop who's going to all these rooms in a hotel. And the room that Bruce Willis is in, they're, they're betting like crazy bets. And the final bet is someone has to have their pinky cut off. So I believe it's Bruce Willis who has to have his pinky cut off and they want the bellhop played by Tim Roth to do it. And they keep goading him and they don't think he's going to do it. And at the end, he just chops Bruce Willis's finger off and walks out with the money. And they're all looking at him like, how could you do this? And you're like, well, you dared him and he's pay you paid him. It's very funny. 1995 ends also with uh, Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys. Uh, 12 Monkeys is fantastic if you've never seen it. Uh, mankind has been wiped out by a plague. They live in these uh, fortified cities. And Bruce Willis is chosen to go back in time and stop the virus, only to find out that he's the guy that brought the virus. It's a time loop movie. It's very, very good. Uh, features a very impressive turn by Brad Pitt, who was just starting to break out of his pretty boy roles into real meat, which he would continue with Seven and Fight Club and da-da-da-da-da. But uh, Bruce Willis is great. Look for a cameo in that movie by Frank Gorshin, who played the Riddler on the old Batman show. 1996, he was one of the voices. Him and Demi uh, are the husband and wife duo in Beavis and Butthead Do America, which I saw opening night, and then the next week went and saw it at the drive-in. Beavis and Butthead do America. Uh, Bruce Willis was great in this movie, dude. Okay, so then uh, the Jackal. This, these are these are just like middle of the road uh, spy movies. Uh, the Jackal. Bruce Willis plays an assassin. I saw that uh, notable because he shoots a young uh, Jack Black in it. Mercury Rising, he's the good guy against Alec Baldwin, who uh, they're they're trying to protect, uh, Bruce Willis is trying to protect an, a boy with autism who solves an unsolvable puzzle, so the government wants to kill him because this guy, this kid could uh, break codes or something. It's very, I mean, it's all out there. Uh, okay, so we've got some some heavy hitters here. We have, um, I, I, I skipped over one because there's a, I'm looking at his uh, IMDB and there's a bunch of cartoons in the middle, but we missed maybe, other than Die Hard, my favorite Bruce Willis movie, uh, The Fifth Element, Corbin Dallas. I did a whole episode on it. Uh, it's a fantastic, different science fiction movie. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I would put Fifth Element over Dune, the one that just came out because it's it's more fun. It's crazy. It's bright. It's day glow. Uh, I love Lilu. I love Corbin Dallas. I even love Ruby Rod. But Fifth Element is fantastic. Uh, 1998, Bruce Willis is in the biggest movie of the year. Harry S. Stamper and Michael Bay's Armageddon. God, if you weren't around. It's hard to describe how big Armageddon was. That huge cast, Liv Tyler, Ben Affleck, Steve Buscemi, Michael Clark Duncan, I mean, uh, um, Billy Bob Thornton. So many people in this movie. This is a Disney movie. It's designed to be a massive hit. They even took a building in downtown LA and put a big sticker on it to make it look like it had been a hit by a piece of debris. They end up having to take it down because it was causing accidents because it looked so real. But man, Armageddon, I saw it opening day. Armageddon is silly, it's stupid, 
and it's so much fun. And Bruce Willis is great in it. Yeah, really, really, really cool movie. Uh, William Fickner is in it. He's a character actor. And at the end, he has this line where he says, Can I shake the hand of the daughter of the bravest man I ever knew? And I remember I actually saw William Fickner uh, at Knott's Berry Farm one day when I was working. And I said, can I shake the man who shook the hand of the daughter of the bravest man you ever knew? And he just looked at me like it was crazy, which was the right response. <laughs> but Armageddon came out the same time as Deep Rising and kicked its butt. Not Deep Rising. That's, uh, I'm thinking about Deep, wa- deep, deep Water Rising? Deep Rising. No, uh, Deep Impact, the other uh, comet movie the asteroid movie coming to Earth. Uh, the Siege, where they take over New York. And then uh, Breakfast of Champions, nobody saw. No idea. I mean, I know it's a famous book, but 1999 is really all about The Sixth Sense, one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, certainly one of my favorite horror movies of all time. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan's out of nowhere twist ending movie that just shocked everybody in the theater. Sixth Sense is stellar storytelling, and Bruce Willis is amazing in it. I I mean, I can't even stress that enough, that these movies I'm talking about, Bruce Willis is amazing in these. He is just so charismatic on the big screen. He is larger than life. He is everything you want a movie star to be. You know, there's a handful of them of my generation. You know, Tom Hanks, Brad Pitt, Bruce Willis, George Clooney. These are just bigger than life movie stars. He was Bruno. He held held, uh, interest in Planet Hollywood, the restaurant. And he just made movies that were entertaining. And I'm not eulogizing him because he's not gone, but he's retiring from movies and we're not going to get any more. And I mean, there are still no joke 40 or 50 movies because I'm only up to 1999. I'm not even, I haven't even got to Moonrise Kingdom, Sin City, Cop Out, The Expendables, Live Free or Die Hard, Planet Terror, Grind House. I mean, Ocean's 12 as himself. Uh, this is a guy with an amazing career. I know he has to retire because he's not well and I wish... God, I wish Bruce Willis the best. What's the line from, and I hate to quote, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but he says, it's um, Jim Broadbent, he says, it seems we've reached an age when life stops giving you things and started taking them away. Like, it's such a powerful line that all these things that we've, that we've collected along the way and all these actors and performers and entertainers that have given us so much, they all start retiring. Bruce Willis is retiring. Jim Carrey is retiring. Actors I love, Charles Grodin are passing away. And it's, it reminds you of your own mortality, doesn't it? Like there is, you know, eventually the the sands of the hourglass are going to run out. Um, again, he's not dead. I mean, even, look at whole nine yards. The story of us didn't even talk about Unbreakable. He did three of them. He did well. He did Unbreakable, and then he had a cameo in the second one, and then he was back for the third one. Glass didn't care for that one, but again, Bruce Willis is good in it. I love Unbreakable. I saw Unbreakable opening night, and I was on the edge of my seat the whole movie. I mean, that's powerful storytelling, just powerful. And maybe that's where we'll find our appreciation of Bruce Willis. Just so darn entertaining. And he gave us all these characters. And if he has to retire, he has to retire. We all say, hey, thanks a lot, man, for just an incredible body of work and incredible moments in the theater. You know, yippee ki motherfucker, and all these lines, you know? I love when he says, I'll kiss your fucking Dalmatian. She goes, you know, this is an emergency channel. He goes, no shit, lady. You think I'm ordering a pizza? Love, love Die Hard. I love it. I think he's, I wrote my own Die Hard clone. I wrote Starstruck, Die Hard at the Oscars, where one action hero has to save the day. 
on a hostage situation. So Bruce Willis has inspired me to even write my own screenplay. And he's Corbin Dallas. I mean, you could do you could do John McClane and Corbin Dallas and call it a day, but he has a hundred movies where he's amazing in it. So, Mr. Willis, we're, we're sad that you have to retire. We understand why, and we wish you the best in your retirement. And maybe you just sit poolside the rest of your life. That's not so bad, is it? Not so bad at all. I'm Jeff Tucker, and this is 91 Reasons. Thanks for listening to 91 Reasons. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Whoa! Say hello to your brother.